All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, anybody uh, anybody in the in the group tonight have uh, any questions from last class or anything else? All right, we're getting down to uh, getting down to the last few chapters here uh, in class. Okay, so uh, including this one, we got about five chapters left. Um, these next after this one, these next three, uh, childbirth, pediatrics, and geriatrics, are uh, ones that historically you know challenge people. So. Uh, next week, we're probably going to take a day or maybe two off and probably give you guys some time to catch up on your on your um, quizzes for sure. OK, I've been harping on that um, and you guys need to get caught up. All right. I know everybody's busy and everything's going on, uh, but we, we've got to get those uh, caught up so that you can finish this class. Um, and then again, those next three classes, three or four classes are going to be. Uh, ones that you're going to need to study, pay attention to, ask questions about. Um, again, I've, you know, I've seen it over and over again over many years where people have a have a difficult time with those. Uh, so again, it's very important that you pay attention to to these chapters. You know, read through them and uh, and ask questions if you're not really sure about something. Okay, let's uh, you know, we got we got deep, pretty pretty good grades going you know going uh, into this chapter. So let's let's keep that going. And make sure that we uh, we're staying on that same track, okay? Uh, as far as tonight, injuries to muscles and bones. Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of the different things tonight, okay? Uh, some of these things are also skills, so we'll talk about some of the skills as well uh, in here. And uh, so make sure that you you know again are reading this chapter well and and are going through it because there's a lot in here. It's about ninety something slides tonight, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so, you know, EMRs will encounter a lot of different types of musculoskeletal injuries, musculoskeletal injuries, fractures, dislocations, sprains or strains, uh, head injuries, spinal cord injuries, chest injuries, you know, a number of different things that we're going to see as it relates to the structure of the body. Uh, you know, a lot of times just a simple slip and fall or, you know, a vehicle accident. You know, or anything like that can be, uh, you can have musculoskeletal injuries, right? So they don't, they don't always have to be major life-threatening issues. And a lot of times that's what we, that's what we deal more with. Uh, we, we deal more with this type of stuff than we do just about anything else. Uh, the biggest part, uh, one of the big parts, and we're going to touch on several of these things tonight, is is anatomy, okay? So some of the things we've already talked about and the things we talk about tonight you know, need to kind of set the tone for, you know, your understanding of how the body is put together, okay? Uh, have a lot of different bones and muscles and tendons and ligaments and everything else in the body, and I'm not asking you to know all those, uh, but nonetheless, we need to kind of have an idea where things are joined at, where things are, you know, how they're connected and that sort of thing, so we have an understanding of what that injury, uh, how bad that injury can be. Again, with the uh, patient assessment, you know, a lot of it is uh, more on the, the feeling perspective. Uh, the patient really is just going to be able to tell you that, that it hurts and that they can't move it or something like that. Or they're, uh, you know, it's, it's painful here, painful there, painful when I do this, painful when I do that. Uh, so a lot of times we're going to have to put our hands on a patient. We're going to have to, you know, move move the, the, the limb around or the body part around and touch and feel and press and kind of poke and prod a little bit and make sure that, uh, that we know exactly kind of where that injury is located. <clears throat> Again, just like we talked about the other night, standard precautions, gloves, masks, that's those sorts of things, uh, just depending on the patient, but typically we're going to always wear uh, gloves. Um, you know, that complete primary assessment, getting a good sample history and uh, and follow it up with a good secondary assessment, you know, making sure, especially if we do any type of interventions that, uh, you know, we want to check and make sure that they're working, right? So the skeletal system consists of 206 bones, right? Little bitty tiny bones, 
you know, the tip of your finger or, you know, at the, the very end of your spine or, uh, you know, in, down in your ankle, you know, things like that in your wrist. Uh, but there are, um, you know, they all have a purpose, you know, and so, and that main purpose is to give that body structure. Okay. It's the, it's the framework, as it says, of your, uh, of the whole body. All right. So again, protect vital structures as well. So of course our rib cage, especially spine, we mentioned that the other night, uh, how it protects, uh, the spinal cord and the nerves, um, body movement, how we actually, you know, you know, we, we couldn't absorb all this, you know, the skeletal system absorbs all that, uh, pounding, uh, that, you know, you know when we walk, you know, um, and then of course, you know, in the marrow, it helps to uh, manufacture red blood cells, which helps to fight off, you know, all the bad stuff in our body, right? Gives us nutrients. So the skeletal system is divided into seven areas. We're going to talk about each one of these tonight. Uh, head, skull, and face, the spinal column, the shoulder girdle, okay, which encompasses that whole front, back, side of the shoulder, uh, upper extremities, which would be the the, uh, the arms, rib cage, uh, the pelvis, and the lower extremities of the legs. So, like I said, you know, looking at the shoulder, um, we have a lot. We have several different connections there, with the clavicle. You know, meeting this. You know, coming around and 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 meeting the shoulder girdle there. Uh, you know, and actually meeting the top. The sorry, the. Uh, yeah, the top part of that ball joint of the shoulder, and that is, uh, you know, that whole thing is going to make up that, and the back of that scapula is going to make up that uh, shoulder girdle. The bones of the head include the skull and the lower jawbone, um, uh, also referred to as the mandible and the maxilla. Uh, the skull is actually many bones fused together. So if you remember when we talked about, uh, we've talked about infants before and have, how they have, um, you know, really weak, you know, skulls and stuff like that. And they have, sometimes they have a soft spot called a fontanelle in there. <clears throat> and so uh, that's from, as we grow, and our brain grows and things like that uh, from birth, that is, that helps us to uh, allow for that you know, that brain to grow inside of, inside of there. And, uh, so you have little plates that kind of allow for that mo that movement. The jawbone is a movable bone, uh, attached to the skull. Again, it's essentially separate, right? So it's a separate bone uh, in and of itself. Um, but it, uh, it's connected in the back, uh, by a lot of, you know, tendons and ligaments and muscles and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that allows it to, you know, open and close, you know, appropriately. So the spine consists of a series of separate bones. We've we've mentioned these a couple times before, uh, called the vertebrae. Uh, the primary, again, the primary support of the structure of the body it takes a lot of a lot of the beating that we uh, endure every day, jumping off the back of a truck or, you know, lifting something or, you know, doing squats or, you know, whatever it might be, picking someone up, right? So it's a, it's a major part of our body. Um, it consists of the cervical spine or the neck, all right? That's seven vertebrae. The thoracic spine, the upper back, you know, kind of the middle part of our spine, that's 12 vertebrae. And then the lumbar spine, the lower back is the, uh, is five vertebrae. So seven, 12, and five. All right. Sacrum and coccyx uh, make up the, the absolute lower part uh, and, and the, our tailbone is the coccyx. And that's, uh, again, just kind of a little offshoot there at the very end. Uh, the sacrum and things like that help to, you know, give us function. I'm sorry, the sacrum and the coccyx give us uh, function whenever we uh, sit down. You know, we sit cross-legged or we sit in a chair or we lean back on something. Um, you know, that kind of helps, gives us that that uh, function as well. So there's another picture of it. So like I mentioned earlier, the shoulder girdle su supports an arm 
and it consists of the collarbone, the clavicle, and the shoulder blade or the scapula. Um, that's again, that's what makes up that that we talked about joints the other day, right? So that ball joint is um, is what uh, is what makes that that sh the shoulder girdle makes that ball joint, and that will uh, allow that uh, humerus head to uh, rotate in there, you know, smoothly. The upper extremities consist of three major bones. Of course, we have the humerus in the arm, right, the upper arm, and the forearm has two bones, the radius and the ulna. Radius and the ulna. One's kind of a primary, the other one's kind of more of a stabilizing bone, a little bit smaller. Same way in the leg. So, the 12 sets of ribs protect the heart, lung, liver, and spleen. Uh, you know, this is, you know, we kind of don't realize it sometimes, and we mentioned this about penetrating trauma the other night, but, <clears throat> you know, whenever we're thinking about, um, you know, how far our ribs, our ribs go, you know, we really have to understand that they, they kind of extend way down. Of course, they don't, they don't wrap around the front. Uh, at the end around the stomach like they do around the chest uh, but um, but we do have a lot of side and almost towards the rear uh, protection uh, with some of these false ribs or floating ribs okay and so it, it's uh, they are there and some of them just aren't connected to the sternum so that's kind of why they're called floating ribs but nonetheless they're there to uh, again give us you know give us function I mean give us support and uh, and helps definitely helps protect all of our internal organs uh, from the everyday bumps, bruises, you know, get knocked around or uh, flying around in a, in a car while it's rolling over, right? So this pelvis uh, links the body and the lower extremities uh, together. Um, again, it's uh, it's really is kind of a load bearing. Uh, section of our body it's uh, you know everything kind of rests on that and uh, that's why it's really important to keep your hips in line and you know just kind of stay um, limber and things like that because a lot of that, when, it, when when all that stuff gets tight you're sus more susceptible to injury uh, in your back and your legs and um, and it just uh, over time you don't realize it but it'll wear down <laughs> It'll wear down your um, joints uh, differently, you know, because you're basically putting more weight on one side than the other. So uh, that's one of those things that just uh, as you get older, you want to try to pay attention to. But uh, so at, as we approach patients that may have uh, chronic long term uh, injuries and, uh, you know, you can probably look at their shoes and see that they wear every day and you can probably tell, you know, how they uh, how they walk and how much uh, pressure they put on their feet. So we mentioned the upper extremities earlier, and the lower extremities consist of the thigh and the leg, right? The thigh bone being the femur, right? One of the largest bones in the body. And then the uh, lower leg consists of the tibia and fibula, right? Plus the ankle and the foot. The muscles of the body provide support and movement. Uh, you know, so muscles are attached to bones by tendons. And cause movement by alternately contracting and relaxing. So we have a few different types of muscle in our body, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, they all, at some point, you know, give us uh, basically an action and reaction capability. Of course, we know what a joint is, right? It's where two bones come together, uh, and those bones are held together by ligaments. Okay, so again. <clears throat> Muscles are attached to bones, all right? So muscle to bone is a tendon, all right? And bone to bone is ligaments, all right? So just try to remember those two differences, all right? Bone to bone is ligaments, and muscle to bone is tendons. So like I mentioned a second ago, we have uh, three types of muscles, the muscle in the body. One of those being voluntary or skeletal muscles. And they're attached to bones and can be contracted and relaxed by a person at will. All right. So essentially that's your, um, you know, like, you know, like a bicep or something like that. Right. Uh, involuntary or smooth muscle 
is um, muscles that are found on the inside of the digestive tract and other internal organs. And that essentially helps uh, that uh, peristalsis and movement of uh, waste products and things like that and um, and fuel for your body throughout uh, throughout your digestive tract. And then you have cardiac muscle, uh, which is only found in the heart. Okay, and so we we talked about that a few times. That's you know again one of the big muscles of the body is the heart, and it has its own special type of uh, of muscle, and that's what gives that uh, the heart the ability to uh, contract, right, and expand, contract and expand. I mean, uh, excuse me, yeah, contract and expand over and over and over again, a hundred times a minute, right? So. That's uh that's something to be you know you, we can get really kind of deep down into it, but ultimately it's uh it's it's definitely something that you have to look at from a perspective of you know whenever we talk about what's wrong with this with this patient you know from a musculoskeletal standpoint you know we may not think about cardiac muscle or smooth muscle but um, you know if they're not able if something's not able to work effectively. OK, so if they're not perfusing blood appropriately or something like that, it could be where that smooth muscle is not getting enough oxygenated blood to it to make it work right. OK, no different than if you have a cramp in your leg from, you know, exercising or something like that. OK, so um, and that would be your skeletal muscle. It's just not getting good oxygen to it. It's not getting the nutrients it needs. And then so therefore it cramps up. So uh, we talked about this before and trauma and things like that, the mechanism of injury, right? MOI and then the mechanism, I mean, the uh, NOI or nature of illness. Uh, so in more on the trauma side, the mecha mechanism of injury is important because we, we can kind of, we can get a whole lot of information about what uh, what types of injuries they can, they have sustained and how, how bad it might be um, based off of what happened. Okay. So. Uh, direct force, indirect force, and twisting force. All right. So, as you can see on the on the picture on the left here, uh, this lady was uh, going forward and hit her knee on the dashboard. Right. That's the initial impact or the direct blow and the or the direct force, and then the indirect force was that causing the uh, hip to dislocate uh, the back. OK, uh, and then, the, of course, the twisting force is where there's a stationary um, something is stationary and the rest of the body twists. OK, so usually it's uh, you see that um, in the ankle a lot, knees, um, you know, you see it in, in sports a lot, right, where people plant whether it's basketball, football, things like that, soccer, and people plant their feet, especially with cleats on and they go to turn, but they haven't lift their foot up yet. And so their their body is planted and locked in place, and uh, and they they put a lot of force into their uh, a very fast turn, and uh, the knee or ankle or something like that takes the brunt of that force. You know, again, like we mentioned this before, it's just something to get used to is is try to get uh, as much information as you can from dispatch to to try to paint a picture. Uh, before you get there, so you start get, gathering some ideas in your head about what might be going on or might, what might be wrong with your patient. Uh, it's not always the best information, but nonetheless, it's uh, it's something to go off of until you can get there. So use your senses of sight and touch. Uh, listen to the information the patient gives you. You know, like I said, we're asking them about their mechanism of injury. Uh, you know, if we get down and sample, we talk about the events leading up to Hey, what happened? Tell me what happened. Oh, you know, I, I was running real fast and I planted and then I was going to turn and jump and catch the ball. But, you know, there was somebody there, so I didn't plant, so I didn't jump and I, I ended up twisting all the way around and, you know, and I heard my loud pop of my knee, you know. OK, that's that's a lot of good information. right? It tells us a whole lot about what could be going on uh, with his knee pain, you know, so. um well, I've told you this before, and I'm glad that's in the slide, but 
uh, you know, the most important part of your job is to provide the best assessment and treatment that we can. So, you know, getting all this information, you know, really kind of uh, getting into uh, the nuts and bolts of, of what ha what's happening, where the pain's coming from, you know, what the severity is, all these different things that we talk about uh, in patient assessment uh, are key. They're absolutely key to, to, to painting that picture for the next higher level of care. So fractures, again, several different types of fractures, uh, but essentially it's a broken bone, right? Um, it just happens that it can happen several different ways. So, uh, again, it takes a pretty significant force to do that, uh, depending on your patient, right? So a, a very young patient or a very old patient may not take very much. Um, it may, in a, you know, you have somebody who falls just right and can break you know, break a hip, break a leg, break an arm, break a you know finger, whatever. I mentioned to you uh, the other night about the lady falling off the steps and breaking her finger, you know, so um, that was her probably putting her arms out, you know, to try to catch herself. And, you know, if you got a, a really heavy patient, you know, it may, it may be more susceptible to broken bones because of their, the weight that is going to be coming down on those, those bones. But um, uh, nonetheless, it's a, uh, you know, it's painful, it's uh, debilitating, you know, and so a lot of times it's hard to kind of do a full assessment because they're in so much pain uh, because of it. And, uh, you know, especially broken uh, hips and pelvises and things like that are very, very painful. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's definitely one of those things where you have to, you know, try your best to stabilize them, you know, and keep them comfortable. And but at the same time, try to get all that information. So. Uh, in an open fracture, the bone is actually is broken and the the overlaying skin is lacerated. So the bone is actually has either is either sticking out of the skin or is has has broken the skin and then kind of make kind of way, made its way back in. All right. Uh, just with them moving or something like that, they, they've you know pulled it back in there. And, um, <clears throat> you know, either way, not good. And, um, you know, of course, it's. It's going to be painful, but also it's going to be open to infection, uh, things like that. Could have some bleeding there. Um, you know, we're really concerned about femur fractures uh, and pelvic fractures uh, causing bleeding. All right, we got like, you know, we went to, we saw that the other night. We have a lot of vascular, um, you know, large vessels running through that area, through the pelvis and branching out and going down. Branching out, going through the pelvis, and then going down the each leg uh, in the femoral artery, and so we got we have a lot of uh, vascular muscle there. So we have a, bit, a lot of big muscle there on our thighs, and so uh, those are again they need a lot of blood. They're full, they have a lot of blood in them, so they're you know you're way more susceptible to uh, various very serious internal and external bleeding uh, from those type of fractures or fractures in those areas. Dislocations, um, you know, essentially the, the joint uh, is has a disruption or a tear somewhere in the ligament, and that allows that one or more parts of the uh, that joint to to misalign, and so uh, it may be kind of caught on the outside or the inside or out front or whatever, uh, but it's not completely separated. Okay. Um, so there's a dislocations and subluxations. Uh, subluxations are essentially a, dis, a, a temporary dislocation. So it dislocated, but then it went right back in. All right. Um, and it really it's it's indicative of them locking in in a in one place other than the normal location. So uh, when it is dislocated, it tip, tip, it's typically staying in a location that it can't get itself out of or without being extremely painful. So. Uh, nonetheless, like it says here, very painful, um, you know, again, debilitating. And uh, there's some there's some slick ways to to, to relocate, uh, you know, fingers and, and shoulders and, and knees and all this other sort of stuff. We're not going to get into that. It's, uh, you know, you see it kind of, you see it from the 
sports medicine aspect. That's really where I, I, got, I cut my teeth on a lot of the stuff on musculoskeletal injuries was in sports medicine in college and high school. But there are, you know, there are certain ways, specific ways to do it um, without that appropriate level of training. You you will hurt somebody or and you you can damage their their joints uh, considerably and ligaments and tendons and muscles and all sorts of stuff uh, by just, you know, oh, let me just pull it, pull it out and I'll, you know, uh, bite on this towel. Let me just pull your leg real quick and throw it back in place. That might work if you're like on the side of a mountain somewhere and you, you know, you, ha you just kind of have to, you know, get, get the job done. But, uh, you know, in, Civilian medical care, that's just uh, just not something we, we mess around with. You know, we're going to essentially treat it like a fracture and uh, we'll splint it like it is or, or you know, uh, secure it like it is and, uh, you know, try to make them as comfortable as possible. So we talked about tendons and ligaments earlier. So this, uh, when we have uh, damage to those, uh, you know, a sprain is... Uh, you know, excessive stretching or supporting the ligament. So a sprain is a damage to a ligament and a strain is, is caused by stretching or tearing of a muscle. Okay. <clears throat> so they have different uh, levels of sprains and strains. Um, you know, just depends on what book you pick up. They'll tell you that they're, um, they're like level one, two, three, or like a grade two, three, one, two, three, either way. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's just, there's total, you know, um, severing of, of a ligament or, or tendon. And then there's, again, just maybe a small tear, a light tear, a medium tear, and it's very, I mean, it's almost cut and then a, uh, severed, um, you know, ligament or tendon. So you just have to kind of play it by ear. A lot of times it's, it's, uh, based off of function and pain. Uh, so whenever we ask them, can you move your, can you, you know, roll your foot around? Can you pick your foot up? You know, things like that. Um, and they, you know, they're just, you know, crying tears. They can't, you know, every time they even move their big toe, it, it hurts. Right. So that's a pretty serious, uh, sprain or strain. <clears throat> um, you know, so on the other side of that, if it's, uh, you know, they, they again, roll their ankle or something like that and they, you, when they when they move it they feel it it's it's uncomfortable but you know it's not really that big a deal they can put weight on it that's another one so if you have a serious sprain or strain in the lower extremities if you can put weight on it that's usually a good sign um without any weight bearing you usually have a pretty serious one maybe a two or three grade two or three <clears throat> so uh again just like a lot of these musculoskeletal injuries uh not a whole lot that we're going to be able to do for them in the field. Really, we're going to evaluate them. We're going, we can put ice on them and things like that. We can secure them, splint them, that sort of stuff. But uh, there's really not, other than a surgical uh, type intervention or something along those lines, you know, that's really only anybody, only thing anybody's going to be able to give other than maybe a paramedic giving them pain medicine uh, for a very serious break or something. So again, several different types of injuries, you know, with, with extremities, there are, you know, we have, of course, arms and legs and fingers and toes and all that. So, um, I mean, everybody's probably, you know, stubbed your toe on a, on a chair or something or, uh, you know, bed post or, uh, you know, had an, had a cut, you know, had some swelling, things like that, you know, and all those things are, are of course possible in, in any of these, uh, any of our extremities. <clears throat> to varying degrees depending on what happened right so you know if we, we if the, our, the hand gets caught in between the top of the car and the pavement while the car is rolling over at 70 miles an hour we're probably going to have a pretty serious hand injury right um and we can have a lot of different things going on there fractures bleeding dislocations um sprain strains you know the whole the whole gambit of stuff in one just in one hand so best thing for stuff like that is literally just to put some ice on it, control the bleeding, put some, you know, put some ice, put an ice pack on it, a cold pack, and um, and then just and then wrap it up and keep it in a comfortable position. Um, 
and you know, a surgeon's going to have to come in, and a specialist sort of hand surgeon's going to have to come in and 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 uh, work their magic on that and kind of sift through what the problems are. Deformity and angulation, again, same thing, same like thing I was telling you about with the lady's finger the other night. Uh, you know, I've seen it before where I was, we were doing catching drills in high school. I'll never forget it. it ran up there. Uh, I was like next in line to catch the ball. And we had to like run, turn back towards the coach, catch the ball. Uh, the guy in front of me ran, turned, and put it, put both hands up in front of his face and, uh, or kind of out to the side. And the ball kind of came a little bit to the side of him and the ball just went and hit his middle finger and then the top of his middle finger only and just knocked it smooth out of, you know, dislocated it and had it sitting completely to the, uh, to the left, uh, the way it should be. All right. And it just stuck there and he just turned around, turned to the coach and said, Hey coach, I need, you know, I need to go see the trainer, you know? So, um, it, it's, you know, you can have something really basic like that or, uh, or like I said, you could have some kind of a very serious uh, deformity <clears throat> where the, you know, the leg is, you know, completely uh, uh, bent to the front instead of bent to the back, you know, so you can have a complete dislocation of the knee to the back, you know, with, you know, severed tendons and ligaments. And, you know, there's plenty of videos out there, sports injuries, ser very serious sports injuries that, that are very gruesome to watch. Um, but um they are just one of those things where, you know, once you get there, you you have to we have to work with what we got and uh, and and see. Biggest thing is we want to try to make sure that we have blood flow, and uh, we'll get into some of that treatment stuff here in just a little bit. Uh, again, some of these things, even even though they're not, uh, it may not be bleeding. We always want to try to wear gloves. Uh, for one to keep our germs off of them right uh but uh but especially when they do have open wounds we don't we want to try to reduce any uh potential infection that they might get uh from us or from the surrounding you know uh area uh, of course we don't want to get anything that they have so uh if you're going to respond to to an mva or something like that especially or any other type of you know traumatic uh, incident you know just go ahead and wear gloves and then it's probably going to be a good idea to wear some type of um leather palm glove over that or some type of you know leather work glove uh that will give you some protection from glass and and things of that nature and you'll probably just either have to uh decon them you know wash them really well uh later on or if you get ready to, to, to get into a patient's uh you know body fluids or something like that you can just take your work your work gloves off you already have your rubber gloves on underneath it and you can do what you need to do So talking about patient assessment for, for musculoskeletal injuries, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's going to be very painful for them. So sometimes they, they don't, they don't want you to touch it. They don't want you to fool with it at all. And, uh, and it's understandable. They're, they're going to be very standoffish a lot of times, you know, they're, they're upset because of the, the pain and, uh, you have to reassure them that, listen, I need to, I need to kind of feel around a little bit. I know it's going to hurt for just a second, but I, I need you to, I need to figure out exactly where this is so that I know how to, to treat it, to splint it, to, to deal with it, that sort of thing, to move you and uh, to, so it doesn't hurt anymore. But, um, <clears throat> you know, so it, it can be a challenge uh, doing that, but none, nonetheless, we, we have to kind of, you know, get past that step. Uh, biggest, biggest issue again is our ABCs, right? So if, you know, if they have a angulated, you know, right leg, that's, you know, completely out to the side and mangled and, you know, meats hanging off and everything else, you know, and none of that matters if they're, if they're squirting blood out of their left arm. Okay. Um, or if their airway is closing off. All right. So make sure that we don't focus on these gnarly injuries, these, these, you know, really bad looking, you know, injuries, uh, and miss, you know, some of the, some of the really critical ABC type, uh, issues that are going on with our patient. Focus on those first, work your way down your checklist. And then when we get there, when we get to those issues, we'll, we'll fix them. Okay. Most limb injuries are not life-threatening. Uh, 
but the biggest concern we have is that bleeding. If they, you know, if some of these uh, limbs are bleeding excessively, then then that's going to be a big cause of concern for us. But uh, for the most part, again, a broken arm, a broken leg, you know, uh, are not going to be, um, you know, issues that we have to just, you know, jump up and, and fix right away. Like I said, we want to inspect that injured limb, compare it to the opposite uninjured limb. So especially if they're straight, you know, if it's really deformed, you can kind of tell it's not going to be the same. Uh, but especially for hip injuries, um, pelvic injuries, if you'll put your feet side by side and you may see a, uh, a distance difference um, or length difference in, e in each leg. Uh, so one leg will be shorter than the affected leg will be shorter than the uh, other leg. <clears throat> but again, we're looking for all that DCAT BTLS, right? Like I told you, we want to get them trauma naked, uh, start, you know, or at least expose that, you know, like I said, somebody falls off their porch and they complain of no other pain whatsoever other than their shoulder, then we're not going to have to, you know, cut their underwear off. Okay. If they walk up to you and they're you know, just fine, no pain in their legs or something like that, and they say, hey, my shoulders hurt really bad, we're not cutting their underwear off, right? So, um, you know, you have to use a little bit of common sense, but, you know, if we have a multi-system trauma, we have a lot of stuff going on or unconscious patient, you know, we need to at least, uh, you know, check these areas for DCAP BTLS and make sure that they uh, don't have any issues uh, with that bleeding, circulation, um, you know, that they are don't have any crepitus, you know, which is those bones grinding together uh, at a break or something like that. And, um, and that there's no other issues going on with those uh, limbs. Like I told you before, we need to, uh, you know, check the whole thing. So, you know, the armpit, shoulders, groin area. You know, uh, once we roll them over, checking all that stuff as well on the back. And, you know, again, do a thorough examination and make sure that we're, we're looking at all that stuff. Um, you know, especially for, you know, gunshot wounds, things like that. You could have fractures with gunshot wounds. So, you know, we're considering that as well. And, uh, you know, making, making sure that they don't have any fractures or fractures that we can that are obvious, you know, that we can tell, um, you know, obviously if their arm is dangling, uh, mid, you know, mid humerus, then, uh, then we probably have a, a pretty good indication that there's a fracture there, right. Uh, or they're going you know, have a spoon fracture or a fork fracture of their, of their, um, wrist or their arm, where if you run your hand down their arm and then all of a sudden there's a bump and it steps up and looks like a fork, you know, then we're probably good, uh, probably good indication that there's a break there. But um, <clears throat> nonetheless, we're going to you know treat it as such uh, and uh, and splint it like it is. So again, uh, one of the big things that we look for, especially when we're splinting, is uh, circulation, sensory, and, mo and uh, motor function, um, and we uh, the the acronym that we we would use for a long time was PMS pulse sensory and motor uh or but or post pulse motor and sensory but that is um just one way to remember it and so ultimately we're going to check for a pulse in that distal the distal part of the uh the limb so the you know the wrist or the foot and we're going to make sure that that has that it has blood flow to it uh, and then we're going to check sensation. So see if they could feel, so they can still feel that the distal end of that limb. And then we're going to ask if they can move it. So can you move your fingers? Can you move your toes? And uh, that gives us an indication uh, that they have, um, you know, good form and function of the limb. And uh, especially whenever we do any interventions like splinting or bandaging, we're always checking pulse, sensory, and motor after each time we do that okay so remember that it's important uh you need to make sure you write that down highlight it whatever uh always check pulse sensory and motor before 
um, or after you, uh, before and after you apply any type of uh, splinting or bandaging. So whenever we're doing uh, doing that, we want to try to cover any wounds with dry sterile dressings. So I mentioned this the other night during trauma. You know, it's it's some of them may not be bleeding at all. Um, you know, you may have a cut, you may have a, a puncture wound, whatever, and they they're just not bleeding. Okay, but still, we want to cover them up. Uh, depending on the time frame, uh, if you have a wound, it's not doesn't need to have any bleeding controlled. Um, and it's still open, uh, and you know the ambulance is going to be like, you know, a few just a few minutes. Probably not a big deal. Leave it uncovered. Let the paramedic look at it, and then you can cover it up, right? Um, uh, not necessarily a, a bad thing, especially in this day and age. You know, we don't take a ton of pictures of patients and stuff. But if you have a clean hand or somebody has a clean hand and said, hey, or take a picture of this arm, this broken arm or this open fracture or whatever, um, not, not a big deal, right? We're not including their face in it. We're not, there's no uh, identifying information in there. Uh, we're taking a picture of the wound itself so that we can show the paramedic and we can either share that with them and then erase it or whatever, right? So we're not, uh, we're not necessarily keeping it for, uh, public record or anything like that. It's really just to uh, share medical information with the next higher level care. Okay. <clears throat> uh, a lot of times for some, for most of these, especially, you know, fractures and painful, you know, musculoskeletal type injuries, you know, sprains, strains, that sort of thing. Initially, a cold pack is a good idea. Uh, just helps to reduce swelling, which in turn helps reduce pain. So if we can get that on there uh, pretty soon, uh, you'll have a um, you have a little bit better outcome generally, and especially if we're thinking a little bit high, farther ahead for fractures, especially or potential fractures, um, it's a good idea to try to keep that swelling down as much as possible because you're going to get better um, X-rays and CT scans and that sort of thing uh, with uh, without swelling. So swelling tends to kind of blur. Uh, or shade uh, the the pictures, so it's a good idea to uh, try to you know keep that pain, swelling down as much as you can. And then of course, if need be, we're going to splint the injured limb, uh, injured part of the limb, and um, and try to immobilize it, which in turn will prevent further injury. So as we were just talking about there, again, prevents the movement of broken bone ends, which is, like I said before, it's called crepitus. All right. That crepitus is the dis is the two ends of a uh, broken bone uh, or the, the two parts of a broken bone rubbing together. Uh, not good. Just, you know, it's painful. It's, uh, you know, it, it can have the potential to damage other tissue and, and vessels around it. So uh, we want to try to prevent that. Helps to control bleeding, decreases the risk of additional damage, and prevents closed fractures from becoming open fractures during movement or transport. Uh, you know, when we're splinting something, we want to remove the clothing from the injured limb, uh, inspect for open wounds, deformity, swelling, bruising, you know, cap refill, all those DCAP BTLS uh, things we, we've mentioned. Uh, note and record the pulse, capillary refill, sensation, mo movement, distal to the point of injury. This is what we were just talking about earlier, right? So anytime we're going to splint or bandage, we're going to check pulse, sensory, and motor. Uh, cover all wounds with a dry sterile dressing before you apply the splint. Um, you know, if it's one, if, again, it's one of those things where we also want to see if we've checked a pulse point. Uh, this is just something that you pick up. Uh, in the field, but it's always a good idea to have you a Sharpie marker or a pen. You definitely want to have a pen. And um, whenever you find that pulse point that you check the pulse at, it's a good idea to um, mark it. Just put a little X right on top of wherever you felt that pulse at. And that way, um, the next person can come right to that X, check the pulse right there, and know that, that that's where uh, that blood flow is going to. <clears throat> it is um, – it you can you like i said depending on the injuries you can have some very serious you know uh t torn muscles you know t you know the flesh being torn away and all this other sort of stuff and you know it's kind of hard to make sense of even what you know that part of the body is it's so mangled 
Um, you know, but uh, nonetheless, we're going to try to do that where we try to find a pulse. And even if it is mangled and things like things like that, it's going to be, uh, you know, we, we want to try to find it and um, identify that. It's going to be very important in, in, a, in a bad uh, uh, injury like that. So always a good idea to really be focusing on where that uh, if that patient has distal blood flow. Justin. Shoot. Uh, on that, if we don't have a cap refill or a pulse or anything, you just hold off on splinting or what? Um, you know, if the, you know, if the paramedic's not there and you're doing it, you know, kind of, you have, maybe it's an MCI or something like that. And you have a bunch of patients and you basically get, you know, thrown one here, here you go. You got to take care of this patient for 45 minutes. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would say that, uh, I would depending on if it's, if it's broken or not, like if it, if you don't think it's broken, I would probably just try to reposition the leg a little bit and see if you get some spontaneous blood flow. So if it's just torn up, you know, if the, if the flesh is torn and the muscles torn, but it may not necessarily be broken, um, then I would just try to reposition the leg, maybe put a little bit of a, a rolled towel or something under the knee. Uh, kind of like when we talked about the other night about, flat, you know, uh, locking your legs out and people passing out. Uh, kind of the same thing. So if you if their leg is you know really like based almost like numb or something like that, or they have a um, they have some type of spinal injury and their legs just aren't working, and so you have to their legs are locked out straight. You may just need to flex them a little bit, and uh, that might uh, give you some blood flow. So not necessarily to answer your question, just one of those things that uh, you just got to be cautious about moving a. A fractured leg. A lot of times we're going to get to it here in just a second, but ultimately we splint it as it lies. And so if it is straight out, um, if, if unless it's the actual knee itself, I would say just put a little something underneath the knee and help to uh, promote some circulation. So. Uh, so again, like I said, uh, note and record the pulse. That's what uh, kind of what I was getting at there is check for that distal pulse and make sure that it that it has one. And then like I was just telling Charles, if you, if you have, you know, if it doesn't have one, you know, you can uh, try a couple of those things and see if see if you get to if, see if you get it back. Um, if not, then we probably are going to need to uh, we definitely want to notate that, but we're also going to. Um, you know, keep trying every so often, uh, and we're going to definitely want to let somebody know. Uh, you know, let the ambulance know either by radio or or something along those lines that we don't have a distal pulse in the leg or the arm or whatever, and uh, you know they need to be transported immediately so that they can try to restore that blood flow. So we try not to like, you know, drag patients around that may have, uh, you know, broken bones and stuff like that. So if uh, it'd be one of those things where the car is about to blow up or, you know, there's people shooting at us or whatever, then we need to drag them, drag them to uh, safety. But uh, ultimately, we try not to move them as much as possible. That way, um, that way we don't uh, cause any further damage. Uh, immobilize the joint above uh, and the joint below the injury site. So it, it's it just kind of depends on where the injury is. Uh, this is kind of talking about, uh, you know, say we have a, a break or an injury or something like that to the, you know, to the lower leg. Uh, if we do that, we're going to we're going to go ahead and stabilize the knee and the ankle uh, that way. You know, they're not flexing their ankle. They're not trying to bend their knee, which uh, might cause more uh, muscle movement, which would cause more tendon pulling, ligament pulling, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, maybe start, you know, move the injury around or move the break around or whatever and cause it to, to, cause it to move. So you can apply that to each area. Um, so, you know, if it was the upper arm, we we're going to essentially uh, – a lot of times the best thing for an upper arm injury is to 
secure the whole arm to the body, whether it's all the way straight down to the side, or if we bend the at the elbow and um, and take and secure the hand basically to the chest, um, and that way it's uh, or a sling essentially, and that would uh, give you that immobilization of the upper arm. If you have a rigid splint, uh, and there's a ton of different types of splints out there, y'all. So, um, you know, we'll show you some in, in the uh, skills lab, but there are, uh, and you can Google it, but there are tons of different types of splints. Uh, if you have some that are rigid, like uh, cardboard splints or uh, plastic splints or anything like that, it's a good idea just to put some some padding in there, and that could be gauze, could be... Um, you know, towels, things, things along those, things along those lines. It doesn't have to be real bulky. Just something to give it some, uh, some cushion. The uh, commercially made uh, cardboard splints with, that you see more most often on an ambulance uh, do have a little bit of padding in there. Depending on the size of the arm or leg that you're dealing with, you may uh, just have to fill in the voids and pack, pack some more. Uh, fluffy dressings or uh, towels or something like that in there. So when in doubt splint, okay? So like I said, if they're in a lot of pain, everything hurts whenever they move it, all this other sort of stuff, just splint it, you know? Uh, it's not going to, like I said, it's typically not going to hurt anything. They're, they, you know, they it hurts when they move it, so let's immobilize it, all right, and, and try to help. And it you know, doesn't necessarily have to be a break you know like i said we're not we can't we don't have x-ray vision so we can't necessarily diagnose uh every closed uh fracture and uh so we're when in doubt just splint it <coughs> so like i said before rigid splints made from a firm material applied to the sides front or back of an injured extremity uh common types padded board splints molded plastic aluminum splints uh, they used to use some uh, a long time ago. They were padded wire or wire ladder splints. Um, essentially, look like the shell, the wire shelving that you have in your closet, but on a much smaller scale. And you just bent them around and all this other sort of stuff to to make a splint with. Uh, they're supposed to be lightweight and and easy to use and all that sort of stuff, but uh, just kind of fell out of the the market. Sam splints, uh, which we'll show you in a little bit, uh, folded uh, cardboard splints. Again, those are what I was just referring to. Those are the most common that you'll see. This is an example of that right there. So uh, the cardboard splint typically comes in a, in a small version like the one that's on their, on their arm. And then uh, one step up. And they have some other sizes and shapes as well. Uh, but generally, these are the two that you see. So a lot of times, it's the lower leg that we're splinting and the lower arm and so you see you'll see where if you look uh proximal okay to the last piece of tape all right so nearest the elbow a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take that especially if it's an elbow injury or something and the arm is bent or the leg is bent we'll take and just cut take our scissors and cut all the way down the side back there where that piece, third piece of tape is on both sides and we'll fold it up and that essentially makes an L. So that's great for feet, all right, or ankles. And so we can slide it in there, put it up, put it up against it so they can't press the gas pedal, so they can't push their foot down. And we'll just uh, put it in place and then we'll take, uh, a lot of times we'll take some type of uh, cling or wrap or something like that, go around it and tape and secure it in place. And that generally works pretty well. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be super tight. We don't want it to be super tight. It just needs to be snug uh, so it doesn't move around. Uh, with hands, uh, oh, I'm sorry, with wrists especially and, and, you know, distal arm injuries, it's a good idea if you'll take a piece of, excuse me, a package of rolled gauze and have them hold it in their hand. Um, they, a lot of times, if, especially if it's be hanging down, or if it's going to start to swell, you'll start to get a little dysfunction in the hand you know, mo movement, especially if it starts to swell. So this just gives the hand a little bit of natural uh, form and um, 
like I said, it, it just gives them something to hold on to because a lot of times that hand is kind of dangling there or the fingers are dangling. And so it kind of fills their hand up. Um, again, same thing we talked about with like ankles, cut it, cut it down a little bit just uh, towards the back and, uh, and flip it up and you're good to go. If you flip that around and put it on somebody's bent elbow, it would, be, it would do the same thing. Um, and then a lot of times any arm injuries like that, other than, you know, say, uh, especially for shoulder injuries, um, is securing the arm to the body. That's usually the best way to kind of keep it from swinging around, moving that moving that ball joint back around, and then as well as with the elbow and the hinge joint. Uh, we don't want it to be flexing and, and moving back and forth. So Sam Splint's been around for a very long time, uh, over 25 years. It's uh, used by the military and stuff like that for a very long time. Um, it's essentially just some foam padding wrapped around some aluminum, some flat aluminum. That's that's literally all it is. I wish I would have thought of it, but it's uh it's very simple. It you can roll it up, you can fold it up, uh, you can fold it in half, uh, and you can kind of bend it back to its original shape. You can ro unroll it, kind of step on it or whatever, and flatten it out. Uh, but you can make uh, you can. Uh, fold it in half like so from take one end and bring it to the other end and essentially make like a u and do the same thing for uh like i said like a an ankle injury or a wrist or something along those lines or an elbow and uh, i've seen we've we've messed around with it in the army we've made uh c collars out of it you know like kind of short c collars uh out of sam splints uh but uh, i've seen people use them for all sorts of uh, silly things and uh, or innovative way things uh, for patient care. So uh, not just fractures, but <clears throat> nonetheless, it's a, it's a cool little tool. It doesn't take up a ton of space uh, in your kit, and it's just one little thing that you can have with you. Soft splints are, uh, you know, there's like inflatable ones and vacuum splints and uh, clear plastic ones and all sorts of different things that are out there that was, you know, real big, especially in the 90s. Uh, they're still kind of big with, um, if you ever looked at somebody who has a fracture in a, like a professional sport or a coll collegiate football game, more than likely you're probably going to see a vacuum splint or, or an air splint on them. Uh, so they are kind of expensive, so you don't see them on the ambulance. Plus, they can get popped and cut and everything else in those type of, in the type of environments that we usually are, are in. So we kind of err on the side of a little bit more of a rugged type uh, splint. Nonetheless, they are uh, you know they're they're pretty good. They they do a pretty good job. You just have to train with them and know how to use them. Uh, the vacuum splint essentially is a, almost like a big bulky. Um, tube that unzips and you put the limb in there and then you just pull the air out and it just pull and it uh, uh when it pulls the air out it forms this um like foam pellets and stuff like that in there it forms it around it kind of makes it rigid uh, almost and that way it doesn't move um and so it's kind of snug on there and the opposite thing for air splints is that you it's uh, essentially just a a plastic bag and uh, has air chambers on it and you can have small ones and big ones and ones that are like uh, bent arms and some that are for legs long legs and stuff like that put it on there fill it with air makes the air makes it rigid and uh, and you go from there so again uh, all good things just depends on what you have where you work at or where you're you know where you're going to be at so nonetheless like i said Pulse sensory motor after after you do that uh, and try to leave that pulse site uncovered. That's what I was getting at earlier is whenever you're doing this, whether you're wrapping a wound or something like that, if you have a pulse point, um, you want to try to leave that exposed. Uh, you may have to get a little creative uh, with how you wrap it or how you put the splint on or whatever. Uh, we've cut little notches out and stuff like that around that area just to give us a spot where we can check for that pulse. So as an example of an air splint, it's a, uh, like I said, just a zippered, you know, clear sleeve, put it over the limb and uh, fill it with air.
traction splints uh, are, uh, again, several different types of traction splints out there as well. They've been around, again, for a very long time. They are uh, ultimately going to be for your lower extremity uh, type injuries, uh, predominantly in the femur fracture area. Uh, that is um, that is one that we that one of the few times where we actually will pull traction on the bone. We'll actually move the bone back into a different position, um, and that is because the pain that is created from a femur fracture is excruciating and the fact that um, it's probably going to ease their pain so it's going to ease their pain but it's also going to uh, prevent that large bone especially when it's especially when it's a, a, an open fracture or something like that uh, it's going to help to prevent any further bleeding and having that um, bone lacerate anything else around it uh, so if we can stabilize it put it into traction uh, we're going to have a just a much more secure break that we can deal with. Um, you, will, I mean, it's it's extremely noticeable. So, uh, first time you ever have a femur fracture, and they say, you know, they're gonna they're probably gonna say their pain is at a you know nine or ten or whatever. They're gonna be writhing in pain, and somebody's probably gonna direct you or you direct your you direct somebody to pull that traction. When you do that, you're probably going to get their pain down at least three or four notches, um, you know, without a drop of pain medicine. Uh, their anxiety is going to come down. Their breathing rate is going to come down. Heart rate is going to come down. So all the things that we want for our patients uh, is probably going to be happening with uh, good traction for a femur fracture. Okay. Um, you know, like I said, it, it takes uh, takes a little um dedication because you're you're kind of once you grab a hold of that foot and pull traction you're kind of dedicated it's not like we can just let it go and you know, take a break and come back okay um you know so once you pull traction on it it doesn't have to be super hard we're not it's not like a, it's some some kind of crazy you know yanking motion or whatever um uh, it's just a gentle pull to the to towards uh towards the foot and uh when we do that then we're going to start to try to work to apply the traction splint which essentially takes our hands off of them and holds that traction for us while we transport. So, uh, like I said, we'll look at some traction splints and go over them. Uh, they are, um, each one is kind of a little bit different, but ultimately we're going to size it up to the leg, make sure that it fits, check sensory, pulse sensory motor, uh, get it wedged up underneath the hip and, um, it has like a little ratchet on the end of it. We're going to hook a little, uh, stirrup around the ankle and then we are going to hook that to the uh, ratchet and then we're going to essentially turn that ratchet until it uh, it takes the tension off of our hands and then from there we can secure we have some straps that will secure around the leg and uh, keep it in place and then from there on out it's just trying to you know move that thing as little as possible and as easy as you can okay So I mentioned the sling and sling and swath, uh, you know, the other day in trauma and that's our bandaging. And so that's uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, like I said, shoulder injuries, again, same thing are very painful. If you ever have one, you understand that. Um, and this is on the left would be the sling. And then the right picture would be the sling and swath combo. All right. So the sling helps to support the arm. The swath helps to keep the arm from moving back and forth okay away from the body so it's like it's like we showed you before that triangle bandage uh you put that elbow in that crease of the triangle bandage take another triangle bandage or something else put it around it up underneath the armpit and um and you're good to go uh sometimes it's it uh it's come a little more comfortable depending on how it's dislocated uh, to which which direction it's dislocated uh, for shoulder dislocations if we place like a pillow or a roll blanket or something like that um, between the upper arm and the chest wall uh, just to give it again give it some type of uh, uh, support there and then maybe do a sling and swath uh, for that so um, that's usually a, a good a good way to kind of stabilize that joint from moving in and out 
<clears throat> elbow injuries, again, not a whole lot that you can do with it. Keep it in the position that you find it. Sling and swath it if possible. Um, if not, we may need to uh, secure it uh, or splint it, you know, and then secure it to the body somehow. Keep it from swinging around. Uh, big towel, blankets, you know, uh, you know, we've used a lot of times we'll use a, uh, a pillow, so a soft pillow. Uh, you can put it on there, kind of make an L with it and just wrap it up like it is here on both on all sides. And that kind of helps stabilize it. Plus it has some padding. So uh, again, elbow injuries are pretty painful as well. Uh, forearm injuries, uh, like I said, can be, you know, just completely almost torn in half and, you know, just a really susceptible part of, uh, that takes a lot of the, of the beating. Uh, it's a very instinctive bone to break, to break. And I mean that by, uh, we instinctively will put our hands out, our arms out, and a lot of times we'll lock our arms, uh, to keep our, the rest of our body. It's just, again, it's a, it's a, uh, instinctual thing that's in our brain that helps us uh, self-protective measure to protect our chest, our heart, our brain, our head, right? So um, that is one way that the body does that is locks its arm out. And um, and so the, the lower arms and hands and wrists and things like that take a lot of that brunt of that fall or um, impact. So when we do that, again, we've talked about air splints, cardboard splints, sand splints, it says rolled newspapers and magazines. Uh, that's, you know, again, one of those field expedient things. If you have nothing else, you could use that. So, um, <clears throat> but again, just something that'll help support, uh, support it from the wrist back to the elbow. And uh, that way it doesn't, it's not like a bridge, it's not just sagging, right? If we do have any little void spots, we can put some gauze or a uh, towel or something like that, you know, small towel in there, give it some padding. Uh, so again, moving down to the hand, wrist and finger injuries, like I said, not a whole lot we're gonna be able to do for it. Biggest thing there is that we can, if there's any bleeding, we wanna control that. Uh, first and foremost, and then uh, usually a big bulky dressing or, you know, wrapping, you know, putting some bulky dressing on it and then just wrapping it all the way around it, uh, keeping it, uh, uh, keeping it kind of immobilized. Again, you could have a small, um, uh, a small, a um, small splint or take a, a medium sized splint and just cut it in half and put the hand on top of it and then wrap around it um, just to keep it in place. You know, something like that. You know, if you think it might, maybe it might bump into something and, and get get uh, injured more, that's uh, totally up to you. But it's uh, that's just one one good way to kind of keep it, you know, especially for something that's really mangled or badly broken in a lot of places and all that sort of stuff. We mentioned the other night any amputated parts. We want to try to keep them as clean as possible and uh, in a cool um, in a plastic bag, and then put them in a in a cool uh, cooler or something like that, not directly on the ice and uh, get it to the hospital with them. <clears throat> so that's what I was talking about earlier about placing the hand into the positional function and that having that rolled gauze in their hand is a good, uh, good way to do that. So pelvic fractures, uh, very painful. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, a lot of vascular, uh, you know, it's very it's a very vascular area uh we have a lot of big vessels that run through here um you know a lot of a lot of the up and does the supply for everything from up and up and down is run through the pelvis uh and down to lower extremities so uh and that's what protects them so whenever we have breaks either at the the uh iliac crest or uh down into the the pubic area uh it's you know it's very very painful uh you know i mean it's uh it's one of those things where you can't cough you can't you can't roll over you can't you can't really do anything okay uh you know it, it's just excru excruciatingly painful so the one of the ways that we can help to 
we're, we're, one of the ways we can look and check for that, uh, and this is part of when we're, we're working our way down our, our uh, trauma assessment and we're, we're doing our secondary, especially we're starting to check the pelvis area uh, for stability or fractures or any, anything like that. Of course, we're going to look and see if there's any uh, bruising, right, any swelling in that area. Uh, if our patient's conscious, we're going to ask them, hey, do you, do you hurt in this area before we touch you? Um, but one of my big things is when I start touching people, I'm going to tell them, hey, I'm going to start, I'm going to start pressing on you. I need you to tell me, you know, if I press somewhere, tell me if it hurts, okay? And then once I get to the hips, as you can see, they're taking their hands and pressing straight down on the hips, okay, in the front. All right, so we're pressing straight down. You'll see some people take the palm of their hand and turn their hand, turn their fingers outward and do that. That's fine. Just don't put your whole body weight on it. All right. Uh, we're just getting getting a gentle push. Again, if we feel some type of movement in the hip one way or the other or both ways and it starts to feel like a separation or we feel crepitus or we hear a click or a clack or something like that, not good. And if you get any of those and your patient's uh, conscious, you will know it. They will let you know. OK, so the other one is we press and then the other one is we kind of rock the hips or roll the hips a little bit and uh, then we'll take and press them in from the side. OK, so we're again taking the hips from the side, push down for the first uh, test and then into the side uh, for the second. Uh, and again, this just checks the stability of the hips. All right. So again, uh, gently do that. And, uh, and if you feel anything, notate that. Again, we're going to have to do a few different things to stabilize the hips. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be very painful and it's going to be have to be done in a certain way. Uh, hip injuries in general, uh, you know, could be, you know, dislocations and fractures of different parts of the hip. You know, it could be, a, you know, the uh, femoral head, uh, which is that, you know, the ball part, the ball and socket. And so that that ball is broken off or fractured or there's encountered some type of uh, fracture to the inside uh, of the socket, any number of things. So uh, we try to immobilize the hips in the position that they're found. Um, you know, pillows are usually a good one. Uh, a lot of times we end up tying, it's called a, uh, a pelvic girdle. And so we'll take in, uh, we'll take a sheet and kind of oppose the uh, the hips, and that kind of brings them together and holds them in place. Um, and so there's some we'll sh we'll go over it in class, but there's some other ones that are some there's some other uh, commercial products out there that are made for that. Uh, as well, uh, but there's some ex field expedient ways that we can help to secure that, and it's essentially just opposing uh, the the hips, and, and we usually with something that's going to wrap around underneath them, and then come across the top and pull from either side, and help to keep the the uh, hips in place. Generally, we'll try to put them on a on a spine board, not because they're spine, but just that it makes it easier for them to transport and that their hip isn't just moving around all the time. Again, it's going to be very painful when you do this, so we're going to need to try to pad the board and that sort of thing. Try to give it as much uh, comfort as you can. So thigh injuries, we just kind of talked about this a good bit in, um, in the uh, you know traction splint section there. But femur fractures, like I said, are very painful. They have a great potential for bleeding. And, uh, you know, lacerating other areas, you know, of the, th of, the uh, of the muscle there and things like that. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that you need to pay close attention to and, uh, and treat pretty quickly and, and make sure that we try to stabilize it as best we can. <clears throat> Like I said before, traction splints are the most effective way to, to splint that. So this is them kind of taking a, say if, uh, if this guy's leg on the upper left picture was fractured, his femur was fractured, you know, you have his partner kind of holding, holding the knee, uh, keeping it uh, in an inline position, and then the partner's kind of holding on to the leg with both hands, 
of the ankle with both hands. And then they are just going to kind of help straighten it out. And this is going to be kind of a painful part right there. But as soon as uh, partner number two starts pulling that, pulling that leg, he's probably going to get that relief that I talked about. So, um, you know, but you got to hold it there. You got to be ready to sit there, kneel there and, and hold it. You know, and sometimes it takes a minute to get everything set up. Uh, knee injuries, like I said before, kind of like uh, what I was mentioning with Charles about putting a blanket underneath the knee or a towel or something. Uh, just usually a good idea to pad up underneath that. Cause there's a natural void under the knee anyway. So um, if it's if it's in some kind of crazy position, uh, then we'll kind of splint it as it lies. But if not, then, uh, like I said, a little bit of uh, flex to the knee with something underneath it to kind of pad it and uh, keep it immobilized. And, uh, and you'll, you'll be pretty good. So that way, when we're if we have them stand up or we're picking them up or something like that, you know, we're not uh, it gives us something to kind of hold on to. That way, we're not having to worry about the, the the knee or the ankle or anything like that flexing back and forth. We can reach, put both our hands up underneath that um, that splint, and then everybody else can kind of grab a body part or whatever and pick them up, put them on the stretcher, and, uh, and that way everything is. You know, the, we're essentially moving the other leg as a unit, not having to worry about the rest of the body. <clears throat> uh, like I said before, if if you have a knee injury that's, you know, angulated, you know, you just tore up, you know, things like that. Um, you know, big bulky dressings, you know, blankets, you know, uh, pillows, that sort of thing. You know, just to kind of put it in place, so especially if you have a, a fracture or a hip that is, you know, rotated outward you know, possibly dislocated or just, you know, torn or torn ligaments or something like that. Um, and the knee is, has damage or something like that too. You know, like I said, if it's, if it's uh, bent and laid out to the side, kind of like that one was, you know, we're just going to put some padding around it, uh, keep it in place, and then we'll, we'll transport it like that. We're not going to try to move that joint around and try to, uh, you know, have the potential for any further injury. Uh, leg injuries in general, uh, typically referring to the uh, tib fib and things like that. You know, cardboard splints work just fine. Again, like I said, we want to try to pad them as best we can. Uh, air splints work great for those. And um, it's I, like the same thing. They could be angulated. They could be, um, you know, just barely hanging on there. You know, so we really just kind of have to be um, a little – flexible in how we deal with it with how we deal with that and use what we have at our disposal that will best help them uh, but they're not necessarily one specific way to do it uh, ankle and foot injuries are uh, again similar to that just like uh, wrists and things of that nature we're going to kind of split it how it is right so we could have a complete almost separation of a of an ankle joint you know it's just you know the foot is facing completely inward you know that's what we see a lot of times is that the ankle rolls inward um but it could be outward whatever you know just, you know so somebody slump, stomps on the on the brake pedal um uh, trying to avoid the head-on collision but they get the head-on collision and their, and their leg is still locked out and just jams everything up back up and just completely fractures and tears open the, the foot uh, or the ankle, you know, same thing. We're going to support it however the best we can. Um, you know, with those, like I said, if you want to try to make make a straight splint into a left or right splint, that's, you know, if something's angled left or right, just cut one side, okay, and then bend and then just uh, cut a notch out of it and then bend it, right? Bend that, that end part to stabilize the other part. And and you're and then we'll just pad up the rest of rest of it, and um, and tape it up. Okay, uh, you don't have to get too crazy with it. It's just you know one little trick on those cardboard splints to uh, to kind of make it you know do what you want it to do. <clears throat> Again, you know, there's like little tricks with like uh, taking rolled gauze and wrapping rolled gauze around anything, a splint, an arm, a head or whatever, 
um, you know, a lot of times it's, it's kind of like the toilet paper roll. Okay. You know, some people want it full coming out forward. One people, some people want it coming out backwards. Okay. Everybody's got their preference, but it's one of these deals where, um, there's, there's some ways just work better than others. So when you're actually, you're trying to get rolled gauze to sit, to lay on something, uh, snugly, if you, if you have it, uh, rolling off the front, it doesn't, uh, you kind of have a space in there whenever you're bringing it around. Uh, and so it doesn't work as well. If you'll flip it over and lay the back of it on, on the, uh, on the surface, and then you can kind of pull against it and keep pulling the whole way around. Um, just again, one little tip trick of the trade that, that helps to, uh, to make things easier, especially when you're having two and three people trying to hold something and you're trying to wrap it real quick and you're, you know, everybody's in a rush to do stuff, the patient's, you know, in pain and all this other stuff. So, uh, again, just one of those little things to practice, uh, you know, splints are fairly cheap. The, uh, you know, the roll gauze is pretty, is really cheap. You can get a, a big thing of it for your department or agency or something like that. And you guys can just have a box of training stuff. Just re-roll it when you get done and practice with it, you know. Uh, other things uh, are uh, ace bandages of different widths. So a lot of times they have four and six inch widths. Um, some they have bigger ones than that, but those are great. They're elastic. They're elastic. And so, you know, you can wrap those around a lot of things, keep stuff in place. Um, you know, if you're not worried about losing it, you know, like I said, you can get some of those really cheap and put in your kits and those are great for, um, pressure dressings as well, uh, for keeping things in place and, and going around stuff and really keeping them snug. So, you know, ACE bandages are a great little uh, addition to your splinting or bandaging, uh, kit. All right, uh, we're about an hour here. We're going to take uh, take ten minutes. We'll come back and we'll get started with uh, head injuries.
All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get back, get started back. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about uh, <clears throat> brain injuries and things like that before. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, one of the first, um, one of the first things that that happens when a you know when you have a, a brain injury like that, it's gonna it's gonna let you know, it's gonna you know it's gonna do a lot of because it controls everything in the body. It's uh, it's gonna be uh, it's it's the the crying child, right? It's gonna it's gonna let you know that it's something is wrong, something bad has happened, or whatever. So, <clears throat> you know, a lot of uh, a lot of issues there, a lot of things that can go wrong. You know, I was telling a story today about a uh, child we had that flipped a four wheeler um, and had a, a very serious brain injury, uh, had some indications of a very serious brain injury right from the get go, which are telltale signs that um, they are, are not going to do well. And uh, saw a picture of him today where he was, you know, still has some some cognitive issues or whatever, but nonetheless, he's happy fun loving kid going to school you know that was four and a half months ago five months ago i think so uh <clears throat> that's uh you know you never can tell right so even even when you have a very very serious patient uh you know that has you know really bad injuries and you know uh closed head injuries and things of that nature uh you know we're still gonna still gonna push hard as we can to try to uh give them the best care that we have available and uh and it's it's important that like i keep stressing that that assessment the physical assessment the the uh, patient history your dcap btls all those different things that you do your head to toe physical exam all all those things are done in that in the in the correct order so that you get as much information out of that patient as you can right a lot of times when you have these head uh closed head injuries uh, and especially in these, in these serious trauma incidents, patient may not be a, a, awake. Um, if they are awake, they're they're probably not going to have a, a whole lot for you, uh, you know, as far as uh, information. So uh, you may have to get your inf some of your information from as far as history and stuff like that from somebody else. Uh, but it's uh, it's definitely something that that bears repeating over and over again, so that it gets stuck in your head. You know that we have got to do. Uh, that those assessments in the right order, okay, uh, and that way we can get all the information possible. Like we talked about earlier, the uh, skull has uh, the crane is the cranium. You know, like we talked about those fused together plates, right, and the facial bones. So we uh, there's another look at the head. You see the cranium there has the the different little plates. Uh, that surround the skull, the uh, the eye socket, the uh, nasal bone. You know, this all makes up the face. The mandible and maxilla. Uh, so mandible would be your jaw, your lower jaw, and your maxilla would be your top. And then you see, kind of, if you go straight back from the word upper jaw, and you go straight back, you kind of see that little notch there where the upper jaw. I'm sorry, lower jaw meets the upper jaw, um, and you can kind of see how it's almost like a little hinge there. And, uh, you know, again, of course, we have a lot of muscles and tendons and ligaments and everything else kind of working all this so that you can, and nerves, especially so that you can, you know, open your mouth, breathe, you know, <clears throat> smile, grimace, you know, all those different types of facial expressions people make. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot going on here. It seems it's a really small area, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot protecting it so, you know there's not a lot of tissue and you know things like that around the around this area so uh, it doesn't take much to you know uh hit your face on something or or your or your skull and have uh some type of adverse injury so <clears throat> as far as again you know the Mechanisms of injury, uh, like I said, it's it's very important that we try to understand what happened, you know, where they were at in the vehicle or how the vehicle rolled over or, you know, where they were in their seatbelt. And, you know, we ask all these questions uh, so that we can kind of get an idea of maybe what part of their head did they, did they hit. 
um, you know, how, how hard could they have hit their head, you know, um, you know, things of that nature. So we, it's, it's really important to kind of figure out uh, some of this information if we can. The, as you can see here in the picture, the cerebral spinal fluid sits between the skull and the brain and acts as like a buffer. Okay. However, just like any other fluid, if you press hard enough against it, it will displace. Okay. It, there's, there is areas in the brain where it can kind of build, you know, get pushed into. So if we have a strong enough impact on one side of the skull, it could send the brain against the back wall or the, or the, the opposite wall of the skull push that uh, C CSF out of the way, cerebral spinal fluid out of the way, and uh, impact the brain, impact the uh, the back, the opposite uh, part of the, the skull, right? So we can have injury to the brain without ever having, uh, you know, without, without uh, at the opposite side of the brain, without ever having, uh, you know, hit that side. So, Little things like that, you know, or, or, or you, you want to look at, um, and we call that coop counter coop. Uh, that's the phenomenon whenever the brain kind of moves back and forth and has injuries on the opposite sides uh, like that. And, of course, it could be front to back, side to side, however. <clears throat> so in a closed head injury, bleeding and swelling within the skull may increase pressure on the brain, leading to uh, brain damage and death. Uh, that's one of the big ones that we worry about is, is swelling. So just, uh, you know, just in general, just like if you, again, get hit in the arm and your arm starts to swell uh, because that, that's been, uh, that site's been injured, the brain is the same way. Um, of course, bleeding, uh, continuous bleeding will help, I mean, will um, increase the intracranial pressure, which then it, then it puts that pressure down onto the brain. Um, and also, also that oxygen rich blood is not getting to where it needs to go because it's coming out, right? So just like any other internal bleeding, uh, it's not good in that manner as well. Uh, an open head injury usually bleeds profusely. We mentioned that the other night as well. Uh, you know, it's very vascular, the scalp and all that. So, uh, whenever it, whenever you do actually have a, 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 a real open head injury, you can expect it to bleed uh, fairly well. We try to, whenever you're doing your head to toe physical exam, you know, whenever you're doing uh, your national registry checkoff and you're just kind of going through the motions really uh, of your, of that checklist, you're not going to really do everything, right? You're not, um, there's not going to be any blood and CHF or CSF or anything like that to, um, to to you know to detect okay so whenever you have a real patient though take the time and look in the look in the ears look in the nose the eyes and see if there's any uh cerebral spinal fluid or blood or both coming out of that all right if you there's a phenomenon called haloing so a lot of times you take a four by four pad and you put it up against the ear if you have blood and things like that fluid coming out of the ear if you'll put it up against the ear, maybe tilt their head a little bit and uh, or on the nose and something like that. And you get kind of like a, a clear fluid, clearish type, yellowish type fluid uh, surrounded by blood. All right. That's called a halo. And that halo kind of in, indicates that there is CSF in the blood. Um, and that's not good. All right. That means that there's that that CSF is coming out for some reason, whether there has been there's a there's a break right in the uh, in the skull somewhere or there's so much pressure built up that it's finding the a way to exit. And it's probably going to it's gonna, probably going to be one of those uh, two locations. OK. <clears throat> so examine those areas, you know, a little flashlight. You know things like that. Look in there, see see what you see, and uh, and make sure that you, you don't have any of those things coming out. Uh, brain tissue or bone may be visible if, with an open head injury. Um, you know, again, one of those things where we're not going to stuff it back in there. We're not, you know, going to put a ton of pressure on there. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, one of those deals where if we got a little, if we're going to wait for the ambulance for a little while. Take a picture of it and and try to you know 
keep it clean, try to control bleeding as best you can, and um, with direct pressure or pressure bandage and, and wrap it up, okay? Um, it's, like I said, wrapping the head is not always easy depending on where it's at. So, you know, we're going to try to reduce our wrapping around the neck, okay, to, to pull up against it, uh, which is what a lot of people want to do. So um, we have a few little tricks and stuff like that we'll show you in the skills lab, but, you know, you can YouTube it and everything else. There's a lot of cool little ways, of t little tricks to do uh, to bandage somebody's head. <clears throat> Such so this picture kind of uh, indicates a little bit of that coop counter coop uh, and type uh, phenomenon that I was talking about earlier in those last two pictures. The first picture, as you can see, if you have basically a hyperextension of the neck, uh, either forward or backwards, where the spinal column um, starts to separate, and pull apart, uh, or compress on the opposite side. So maybe be pulling on one side, compressing on the other, and you can. Uh, have, you know, disc fractures, you know, um, displaced discs, you know, it may uh, shift and put pressure down onto a nerve, um, you know, any number of things like that. So you could have temporary par paralysis <clears throat> from, from things like this, where uh, it, you just have trauma to the spine and it doesn't really know what to do. <clears throat> Uh, again, we've talked about this before, but again, it bears repeating. So for brain injuries, head injuries, confusion, uh, unusual behavior, unconsciousness, nausea, vomiting, blood from an ear, uh, decreasing consciousness, unequal pupils. You know, these are all signs and symptoms of, uh, of a head injury. Okay. Uh, again, sleepy, tiredness, you know, that sort of thing uh, are, is one of those as well. Uh, again, the... the when you have several of these things, we start adding them up and then you have the need to vomit and they're real confused. Those are, those are signs that you need to uh, kind of look a lot, a lot closer at, at a potential head injury. Seizures are another one. So if we add them all, if we add some of these other things up and they're having a seizure, probably a good idea that there, that something's going on there. Of course, external head trauma, bleeding, Bumps, uh, bruises, hematomas, which is just basically like the golf ball, uh, you know, sitting on top of their head. You know, those are, um, you know, the, the lady that fell down the stairs the other day I tell, told you about, you know, she had a large hematoma on her um, on her head that popped up. And, you know, she was complaining of all that. She was complaining of wanting to vomit, you know. So pretty sure she had a closed hand injury, you know, which is very indicative signs of all that. A little confused. Uh, so <clears throat> definitely something uh, to be looking for. A serious head injury may produce raccoon eyes and battle signs. Um, if you'll note in this picture, whenever it comes up, it uh, on the left is what we refer to as raccoon eyes. And essentially, if we see this more often in what we call basal skull fractures, um, where the base of the skull, where it kind of meets the, the forehead there or at the forehead, uh, when you, so if you hit the front of your head on something or the, the frontal lobe of your brain has a bleed or pressure, uh, some of that blood will pull down into the, into the orbital, orbital area of the, of the eye and cause it to uh, be discolored like that, like a bruise and uh, battle signs, same way. If you have some, uh, you know, some uh, head injury to the side of the head uh, or the, the back of the skull, uh, you may refer to, they are, these are referred to as battle signs. So you may have some uh, bruising and, and redness and things like that behind the ear. Like I said before, not a whole lot, you know, at, at this level that we're going to be able to do and in most levels. I mean, you know, at the paramedic level, there's there's limited things that you're going to be able to do for a head injury. Uh, big thing is going to be the airway. OK, uh, we harp on it a lot. I understand that. Um, and it seems like it's really something simple and there should be some other kind of Gucci cool thing that we we're supposed to do for a head injury or something. But it's not. OK, um, you know, we're just not brain surgeons. We don't have the equipment to do any of that stuff or the training to do any of that stuff in the field. And so 
uh, we're going to control bleeding. We're going to make sure that they have a good patent open airway uh, and that their, their breathing is adequate. All right. And if not, we're going to support that and do it for them. Right. Uh, we're going to provide some O2, try to keep that oxygenated blood flow throughout their body. So, um, you know, we'll uh, try to mobilize the head and try to keep their, their head and neck still as possible. Again, you know, bandage and pad the uh, the head as best as we can as well, you know, to prevent any further injury. Uh, but other than that, you know, that's that's really what we're going to be worried about is breathing the circulation. Again, as far as your assessment goes, like I said, we're going to look at, um, you know, whether or not blood or CSF is coming from the ears or nose. We want to see that. Oh, we want to check that. Uh, control any bleeding. Examine and treat for any other serious injuries, and arrange for prompt transport. And that's it. And that's it's uh it's frustrating. I you know like I said having having uh, experienced several uh, serious head injuries in the last uh, several just in the last few months. I can tell you that um, it's it, it is frustrating because there really is not a whole lot to do. And when you have family and friends and bystanders and everybody else looking at you and you there's really not a whole lot, you know, you're, you're, you've got the airway thing going on, you got the breathing, you know, for them or whatever, um, bleeding is controlled, you know, if they have fractures, you know, we're, you know, that takes a back seat at the, at the moment and we're worrying about, you know, ABCs and that, and that's it. And once we, once we work those things out, then it's a lot of kind of hurry up and wait. Okay. So uh, you know, doing good physical exams, you know, if you, especially if you have multiple of you on scene, uh, you know, somebody kind of worry about that airway and, and circulation and, uh, air, and somebody else can be doing a, uh, a head to toe exam, getting them trauma naked, um, you know, taking vital signs, you know, that sort of stuff and, uh, and, and being a good team kind of spreading out the work, um, but coming back together every, every five minutes or so and, uh, and getting that, uh, getting that information, make sure everybody understands what's going on, what the vital signs are, what the total overall patient uh, status is, <clears throat> and uh, you know we we'll keep doing that every five minutes until until a higher help arrives. Okay, and it's just it's that that simple, right? There's just not a lot of invasive stuff that we're going to be able to do for them. Uh, injury it's like that kid, it's like that kid on a motorcycle, though. Uh, like with his jaw, he really needed to be intubated, but we didn't have nothing to intubate with, right? You know, because of his jaw situation, and he wasn't breathing, so it's a miracle that kid survived. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, so there, uh, you know, that's gonna be something where you know that that happens, and you may have airway swelling because of that. They could have hit their throat or whatever, and had damage to their to their uh, trachea or something, and so you know the flight medics are gonna have to get in there and do. Uh, do a, a tracheostomy or something like that and um, and do a surgical airway or something, you know. So it's, uh, it, like I said, it's frustrating. It, it, it really is because, you know, it's, it's one of these bad patients. There's just nothing, there's just not a lot for you to be able to do in the field, you know. Yeah, that's right. We just, we put the ambu on and just tried. That's all we knew to do. That's right. That's, that's, all you, that's all you can, you know, you, like I said, you work through the things that you have available to you. You know, I mean, if you have, you know, your your J tubes, and of course, with this, a lot of times, if we're doing ambu bags or, or if we're, we're doing uh, uh, mask breathing or something like that, uh, for head injuries, closed, especially closed and open head injuries, um, using a nasal airway is typically not recommended, uh, especially when we're just really not sure about where the fractures are in the face and the and the uh, the, the skull and stuff like that. We don't want to use a nasal airway. All right. So just remember that um, nasal airways are contraindicated for uh, head injuries. All right. So go to the oral airway or, um, you know, or just a manual, manual opening of the airway. Okay. And try that. <clears throat> So injuries to the face, of course, could be from anything, like I said on the last slide there, you know, vehicle accidents, assaults, uh, you know, falls, any number of things, any number of reasons why. I mean, you know, you, you fell off the the uh, carnival ride or something, you know, I mean, who knows, right? 
um it just it just uh it could be a lot of different things but <clears throat> but nonetheless uh, like i said a lot of a lot of little uh things that can go wrong there a lot of a lot of blood you know uh, a lot of vasculature in the face you know, we mentioned that before it's like the scalp same way you know it doesn't take a whole lot and it'll start bleeding heavily it'll look like it'll look like they're you know bleeding out two or three liters but you know it's 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 really not so uh, nonetheless, we want to control that bleeding and, and any other type of bleeding that's, that's going on in the face or, or that area as best we can. Typically, the direct pressure is also going to be directly painful because we're having a push on the area that is also hurting. So um, you, you just have to you know do the best you can with that. Sometimes uh, having them hold it you know might might help if they're conscious. Say, so here, you hold it on there. Uh, if you tell me, you know, that way you can kind of control the pain or whatever. Um, Again, ice packs, that sort of stuff is going to, you know, kind of help cool, I mean, uh, ease the pain a little bit, uh, bring the swelling down. Uh, other big thing with that, uh, just like we mentioned earlier, is the airway. So making sure that the uh, the airway is, is open and not damaged <clears throat> and that uh, we they can breathe in and out. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, if you guys have seen it, uh, but there's a picture that's, I guess popular in the trauma world, and it's a picture of a a guy who attempted suicide by shotgun to the mouth and failed. Uh, he's alive. He was alive, and and his whole but his entire face is just in ribbons. Jaws gone. I mean, it's just a big. Uh, if you ever watch the movie Predator, when he opens his mouth and the big all the you know big teeth or whatever open up wide like that. It was similar to that. Uh, you could, all you could see was his eyes. You couldn't really tell he had a nose and all that. Uh, but his thing is that he's leaning over and allowing that blood and fluid and stuff like that to drain. Uh, and so that may be something where if you have something like that with a lot of uh, trauma to the face, have them kind of in a uh, tripod type position where they're seated and they're leaning over and, uh, and let some of that fluid uh, fall forward. Uh, out of the mouth, blood, and things like that, and that's going to uh, potentially will help uh, uh, reduce the occlusion of the airway uh, for one, and then there may not swallow all that inadvertently, the blood and fluid and things of that nature. So uh, little things like that could, could help your patient. Just one of those that you have to look out for. Uh, you know, again, those types of things do happen, and it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, again, if it's not just – they may be bleeding, but it's not life-threatening bleeding like we talked about the other night. And so it's uh, we may have to take some of these big abdominal pads, like we mentioned, uh, you know, towel, clean towel, things like that, and just provide gentle pressure against it to kind of keep some of the blood, um, you know, try to provide some type of direct pressure. Uh, but again, there's no rhyme or reason for that. It's just how, whatever is necessary for that type of patient. Uh, again, treatment of facial injuries, uh, if they if these measures do not keep the airway clear or if you're unable to control severe bleeding, log roll the patient onto the side. Uh, like I said, it's just one of those things, just kind of like what we were just talking about with the tripod position. If they are laying down and they're not able to do that, then uh, the best thing is going to try to do some type of gravity uh, movement, and that's essentially the recovery position or a log roll in this case if they have a, a neck injury. <clears throat> excuse me, a back or neck injury, and that way, uh, you know, they don't aspirate that that blood down into the airway. Again, mechanism of injury is important, like we've been talking all night about that, and it's, you know, you, you could have a, uh, a rear end collision, you know, that causes the, the head and the body and the neck to, to go one way. Uh, you know, if you... Uh, if you're the one hitting somebody from the rear uh, in a car, you know, it's going to be the opposite reaction, right? So it's, uh, you know, maybe if you landed uh, really hard on your feet or on your, your maybe a diving accident where somebody dives in head first and, and hits their head straight on and you have more of a compression type injury, uh, you know, each one of these has different characteristics as to what, uh, you know, how, how it may affect the spine. So, 
again, all those things are going to be pretty uh, unknown to us other than other than either the pain or the dysfunction of the patient. So they're not able to, you know, they're maybe paralyzed, partially paralyzed, uh, you know, things like that. And they're, they, if they're conscious, they're able to tell you, hey, my neck hurts uh, here, here and here or right there or this spot, you know. And uh, so, you know, it's important. And we see it a lot of times where people just kind of pass over and just, oh, they feel the back of the neck. They don't really know what they're feeling, right? Uh, we refer to them as step-offs. So if you think about, if you look at this person's spine in this picture, and if you just imagine if you took your finger and ran your finger down the, the top of each one of those vertebrae, right? And so you're hitting, you're, you're feeling each one, click, 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 click. And as you get down, all of a sudden you go click, click, and then your, your finger kind of falls in and doesn't go click. It just, it just falls into a, in a, to like a socket, right? That would be a step off. Okay. So we essentially took a step and there was no step there. All right. Um, and that may be an indication that that, uh, a vertebrae is shifted or damaged or something along those lines. <clears throat> we don't know what that means, right? We can't tell. We can't see what that means. Uh, but we can notate it. Hey, around, you know, C5, you know, we had a step off, right? Maybe you could even mark it if you want to, you know, take your pen, take your marker and, and draw an X on it. You know, hey, I felt a step off here. Right. And we'll work our way down the spine, any point tenderness, you know, DCAP, VTLS, anything like that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll notate our findings. And, and, and uh, again, we're going to mobilize, immobilize uh, this patient and keep them as, as in line, as still as possible. And we'll go from there. <clears throat> again, injury to the spinal cord high in the neck paralyzes the diaphragm, results in death. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, important stuff in the back of the skull and the, especially near the, the form magnum in the bottom where the, the spinal cord meets the, uh, the brain. And so, and they're back there for a reason because they're, because they're, you know, kind of protected in the back. Usually, you know, just in general, we kind of face forward, we walk forward most of the time. And that's where a lot of our injuries occur is in the front of our body. Uh, and so those important things are kind of back there, kind of protected in the back. However, if we, if we encounter those uh, injuries to these areas, uh, they typically have pretty uh, far reaching and, um, and deadly type effects. Okay. So, <clears throat> that's one of the bad things about that these these high cervical uh injuries is that uh, is that they can have some pretty serious uh consequences uh gunshot wounds to the chest or abdomen abdomen may uh produce spinal cord injuries we mentioned this the other night when we talked about trajectory of of gunshot wounds and wound channels and all that and and so you always have to you know do that whole uh body assessment Yes, it, it's, you know, people kind of start getting uh, tunnel vision on the gunshot wound and the exit wound and all that sort of stuff and bleeding control and packing wounds and all this other cool, I say cool stuff, but things that are kind of hip these days or whatever, and they forget to roll the patient over and check the back, right? Uh, so that that wound, you know, just like the magic bullet, that thing, especially in these smaller rounds, can just bounce off of big bones and change its trajectory and go go uh, to another section of the body uh, and hit all sorts of stuff, right? So it doesn't take much. I mean, if somebody gets shot in the front of their body, in the stomach, I mean, it's it's just a 50-50 a chance if it if it goes to one side of the, the spine or the other. So, um, you know, if it makes its way right in the middle, I mean, you're, that's it. I mean, you're going to, you potentially have a, uh, a, a, you know, a projectile, you know, impact the, uh, the spinal cord. So, uh, again, not a whole lot we can do for that. And we're not going to necessarily know that. However, if they say, Hey, no, I didn't fall. I didn't do anything else. I was shot two times and now I'm having paralysis or whatever, uh, or, you know, my back hurts and I, I didn't fall. I didn't get in a fight. I was just shot twice. You know, 
hey, we might need to, you know, th think about, you know, spinal mobilization and, you know, things like that because of the mechanism of injury, right? And we wouldn't know that until we did a full exam, did a full history, that sort of stuff. Of course, the common ones, falls, motor vehicle crashes, stabbings um, are all uh, common mechanisms of injury. Uh, a suspected spinal injury, a suspected spinal injury if the patient has sustained high energy trauma. Okay, so uh, falls greater than six feet, um, you know, if it was a high speed crash, rollover, ejection, that sort of thing, uh, you know, uh, high speed sports injury, somebody's running full speed and got, got hit in the back or uh, got hit in the sides, got hit in the head, something like that. Um, you can reasonably assume that uh, that they may have a spinal injury. Uh, signs and symptoms of spinal cord injury. Um, again, it's not all inclusive, and not every not every injury has these. But uh, laceration, bruise, other signs of injury to the head, neck, or spine. Uh, tenderness is going to be one of those over the point to where that that issue. I mean, where that uh, that part of the spine is is affected. That's why I was telling you, run your hands down there, look for step offs, tenderness, all that. Decap VTLS, and. Uh, and do a, you know, like I said, do a good thorough physical exam. Uh, extremity weakness, numbness, paralysis, or loss of movement are all you know big indicators as well. Um, and again, we have to kind of if it if it's multi system trauma, and they have a head injury also. That's something we have to kind of factor into that. We may not necessarily be able to uh, pinpoint that it's a it's a spine injury. It could be a head injury also that's causing that ha to happen. So, um, err on the side of caution. You know spinal spinal cord restrictions and um and then go from there you, you're probably not going to be uh not going to be wrong for doing that um you know and, and if you're erring on the side of caution so again signs and symptoms loss of sensation of movement tingling burning sensation in any part of the body uh uh in the neck things like that uh, loss of bowel, bowel or bladder control. Uh, you know, any of these that could be possibilities. And this is uh, any part of the body below the neck uh, is some of those are, again, pretty indicative of, of those types of spinal cord injuries. So, uh, again, the treatment of spinal injuries, like I said, is really just about keeping the patient still, keep them in a neutral position, uh, transport, them, transport them as such. So, uh, C collars, placing the C collar on correctly. Uh, you know, I've seen it recently. You know, people who've been EMTs for a while, you know, and should know how to put on a C collar that just completely screwed it up. You know, I mean, just don't know how to work it at all. And they ride the ambulance every day. So, um, you know, don't be that person. You know, learn your equipment. Make sure you know how to use it. Use several different types of, of equipment. And, um, and be good at it, you know, make it a habit of being good at it. <clears throat> so again, we still at the same time want to maintain an open airway. A lot of times when we have these, especially we're going to uh, gravitate towards that jaw thrust maneuver in our uh, unconscious patients. Uh, and then we'll try to, you know, get some type of adjunct in there uh, for just a spine injury, not a head injury, like we mentioned earlier, you know, an oral pharyngeal airway or nasal pharyngeal airway uh, would be preferred to try to help kind of keep that airway open. And then of course, uh, later on, if the paramedic so chooses, depending on the, if they're breathing or not, you know, they may intubate or something like that. Uh, again, as always, we're going to monitor uh, circulation, airway breathing, and, uh, and making sure that all those are adequate. Good. Uh, like I said, every so often, especially when we're transporting, um, you know, you can check that pulse sensory motor uh, distally uh, in, the, in the arms and legs and just uh, or on the hands and feet and just try to see if we have any of those uh, maybe spontaneously reoccurred or if they had it and if it, they may have lost it, you know, so uh, just making notes of those during our reassessments to ensure that uh, we didn't lose any of that pulse sensory or motor function.
So uh, motorcycle and sports helmets, uh, this is something that, you know, just wasn't really thought about too much uh, back in the day. And it's really kind of become something that uh, is important. They built helmets a lot more, a lot better these days. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's still kind of a chore um, to to get somebody out of one of these helmets without like pulling on their neck. And uh, <clears throat> so it really is just kind of about being familiar with some of these helmets, uh, get your hands on some, you know, borrow some, have you know, we have manu manufacturers. If you tell me we're the fire department or EMS agency and you said, hey, look, you know, we're going to do some training. Could you send me, you know, your three pop most popular helmets? And we'll get them back to you. We'll get them back to you. You know, we just want to do some training. You know, or maybe like a, a um, you know, a helmet sales, you know, location or something like that. You know, just worth a shot. You know, it's been done before. Sports uh, teams as well. So if you have local sports teams, say, hey, look, college, you know, uh, high school, uh, professional team, whatever. Um, you know, could you send me a couple of your the type of helmets that you use and face shields that you use? And we're just going to want to do some training. Most of those have plenty of excess uh, helmets that you use for parts and training and stuff like that too. So uh, backups and all that, they, they usually will have no problem doing that for you. Uh, but try to remove part or, or all of the helmet only under the following two circumstances. When the face mask or visor interferes with adequate ventilation or with your ability to restore an adequate airway. Uh, for the most part, if you have a screwdriver, you can usually take, a, take off the whole face shield um, face guard, all that stuff, and you can usually have uh, pretty good uh, access to everything you need, nose, mouth, all that. So if you don't have to remove it, don't remove it, okay? Um, but uh, when the helmet is so loose that, the secu that securing it to the spinal immobilization device will not provide adequate immobilization of the head. So if it is a loose helmet or something like that anyway, and it's not going to it's not going to be an issue taking it off of them, you know, it's going to be loose while you have it. You know, if you try to tape it down and it's going to be loose and their head's going to be loose in there anyway, just take it off. All right. Uh, when we take it off, we're going to support the head and neck, uh, kind of put our fingers in there on either side of the head, support the head, and then have somebody remove uh, the helmet while we stabilize the spine in a neutral position. All right. Injuries to the chest. Uh, you know, again, a lot of things that can we, we got going on here. Of course, we have the 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 musculoskeletal part of it, uh, and we have the lung part of it, right? Uh, so, or the lung and the heart part of it. So, that's uh, you know, those are those are some of the big uh, big twos, or the two of the big three there, and we want to make sure that we uh, that we have some options here uh, for treating these types of injuries. <clears throat> fractures of the ribs again every single fracture produces pain at the site and difficulty breathing uh you can you know that's just a a go-to sign and symptom there or signs and symptoms are um that painful breathing so whenever you take a big deep breath a lot of times it's, it's just going to hurt and um you know multiple fractures you know you should be able to have that pinpoint tenderness and that's again as we're going down the chest, we're decap BTLS. We're looking for, uh, we're looking, feeling for any of that crepitus, right? We're feeling for any instability in the rib, and uh, we're looking for any response from a conscious patient uh, of pain, right? And we're trying to locate that. We can again with our, with our uh, marker or a pen, we can mark those ribs with an X, and that, the site where the pain is the worst. And that you know again give the next higher level of care an indication of exactly where that. Uh, fracture might be or injury might be uh, so you can have that tenderness swelling all that sort of stuff and not have a broken rib okay so you still have the space in between there they could have got lucky and got right in between there and just have a, a you know a bruised section uh, of that space uh, you also, when, when you have these rib fractures, you can also have um, injury to the underlying organs. Uh, if it is a complete fracture um, of the of the rib, a uh, really forceful break of the rib, and it's uh, essentially, you know, pushed back towards uh, the lung, you know, any of these other uh, ancillary organs, 
you know, you could have uh, some type of laceration of those underlying uh, tissues and 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 uh, the lung and different things like that and other organs. So um, there could be some type of internal um, bleeding or anything like that associated with these as well. So same thing, just because we have a rib fracture doesn't mean we're not going to going to, you know, check blood pressure, do our whole, you know, round of vitals and all that sort of stuff. You know, some of these, again, could have an underlying issue going on, and we may start to detect that uh, in our vitals. So a little bit of pressure, like I said, as we're going down, just a little pressure to, to see if there's any crepitus there or instability. Um you know, placing a, it says placing a pillow against the injured ribs to splint them. You know, there's been a lot of different things over the years uh, when we talk about stabilizing broken ribs. Um, you know, we talked about putting IV bags on there and taping them down, and we'll get into flailed segments in a second. But, you know, there's um, you know different paddings and bulky dressings and all sorts of stuff. And, <clears throat> you know, some of them say they give them some relief and some say they don't. So... Uh, it's just one of those things where if, if it provides the patient comfort, you know, probably not a bad thing. Okay. So if a pillow makes them feel more comfortable or some type of, you know, bulky, uh, you know, rolled towel or, you know, uh, blanket or something like that gives them some type of comfort, you know, sure. No problem. You know, secure it to their body and, um, and go and roll with it. Okay. So we try to prevent that excessive movement. We try not to have them talk a whole bunch um, because usually just talking, coughing, all that stuff is going to be excruciatingly painful. Um, so uh, especially when you have a flail chest segment, a flail chest segment is essentially like you saw. Let's see here. I'll show you this next picture. The essentially the one rib is broken in two places or more than one place along the same rib line. Okay, so we have that, we have a uh, an even more unstable uh, chest wall, okay? And so remember, we have that lung that when it inflates, presses up against that, uh, that chest wall, right? And so essentially, if it has a weak spot there, that lung, when it inflates, is going to start to try to push out of that space. And so it's what's going to happen as it tries to push out of that space, it's going to it's going to in, uh, encounter this jagged edge of the bone and things like that. And then these broken flailed segments moving back and forth as well. So uh, we, we try to stabilize these uh, as best we can. And like I said before, it's uh, definitely going to be very painful, painful, painful to breathe, uh, definitely unstable point tenderness, uh, you know, for sure. Um, it's it's also going to affect how much uh, oxygen exchange happens, and it's going to essentially decrease that. And when we when we get to the point to where um, you know that difficulty breathing or the painful breathing turns into difficulty breathing, you know uh, that's a lot of times whenever you know you start to see that patient's anxiety go up, the heart rate goes up, blood pressure, all that sort of stuff. So um, you know we try to get these issues corrected as quickly as we can. Uh, like I said, put something on top of it, not necessarily a bad thing. It's just uh, depending on what you do and how you do it, uh, whether it works for that patient or not. Uh, essentially, we don't want to, you know, prevent any the movement of the chest, though. So we still want the chest to be able to rise and fall uh, as normal. Um, and especially if they're starting to have difficulty breathing, we don't want to restrict that, that movement of the chest. But at the same time, we don't want that flailed segment just moving all around. Uh, you know, if you have to, you can use a bag valve mask, supplemental oxygen, and, and help uh, support the patient's breathing if it gets low enough. Uh, monitor and support the ABCs and arrange for prompt transport. Like I said, not a ton of stuff that we can do for that patient in the field. We mentioned a little bit the other night about uh, penetrating, penetrating chest wounds, uh, sucking chest wounds, you know, things like that. Um, you know, an open pneumothorax, you know, anything like, you know, like that where the air is coming into that pleural space. Um, 
And so, like I mentioned before, as you can see on the left-hand side here, so you have the lung is the, the darker pink, and you have the, the, the wall is that outer ring, right? Um, and so you have that pleural space in between the lung and the chest wall, okay? And so that's, that's the space that allows the lung to inflate, deflate, inflate, deflate in that space, all right? So when air comes from the out, I mean, when there's a hole or a puncture or something like that from the outside, and it, it may allow air into that pleural space. When that, when that air accumulation happens, it's going to start to uh, cause a deficit of expansion in the lung. The lung's not going to be able to expand as well, okay? So uh, when that happens, the air is going to escape, okay? And it's going to get into that pleural space and, and slowly but surely collapse the lung or allow the lung not to expand, okay, uh, as well, or and then eventually not at all. So uh, what we want to do is stop that air from coming into that pleural space. All right. Um, sometimes, depending on what the how the injury occurs, uh, you could have blood in that space that's also causing that to that push against there. And uh, we're, you know, we aren't, but you know, uh, higher level providers are going to have to do some techniques and things like that to try to uh, alleviate some of the blood out of that out of there. And you know, chest tube or you know, a couple other different things. But that's you know, that's just one that's the one main way that we can do that is by an occlusive dressing. So, uh, you know, like we mentioned before, we saw that picture the other night about the blood loss, right? And we showed you how many liters, uh, you know, are in the chest and it's, uh, or pints, or whatever's in the chest, you know, it's, it's a good bit of blood, right? And so it can hold a lot of blood in that cavity. Um, and, um, and you may not even realize it until it's too late. So, uh, again, blood loss into the chest cavity can produce shock, right? So hy it's be essentially hypovolemic shock because the blood's not able to circulate. Okay, it's just sitting there, uh, and it's it's uh, it's out of the system, right? So we want to try to quickly seal that open chest wound with an occlusive dressing. I mentioned that the other night. There's some type of uh, chest seal, whether it's a commercially made chest seal that goes over it, has little vents on it, and all that sort of stuff. Or if it's a piece of plastic taped on the sides, you know, with maybe like a little area where you can, you know, burp it or uh, vent it or something like that. Uh, again, we'll go over these things and I'll show you several different uh, examples of that in the skills lab. Um, administer oxygen if you have it, you know, again, not a bad thing. We have a breathing problem. You know, this is, uh, you know, they're not breathing well. So, you know, provide an O2 uh, with at least a, a non rebreather is going to be uh, um you know, probably a good thing to do. Uh, if a knife or other object is impaled in the chest, do not remove it. So we talked about that the other night as well about impaled objects. We want to stabilize it, leave it in place, and uh, and don't just take it out. Okay. Um, we don't know what it's. We don't know what it's. Uh, you know what it's impacted in there. Uh, we've they've had indication. You know they have had they have had incidences where. The impaled object was actually had um, the blood flow constricted, and once they pulled the object out, they just immediately started bleeding, and they would, you know, become very critical or even die uh, because of that. Because you know they didn't have those the um, things in place to prevent that. So don't take it out if it's impaled. Don't take it out. Leave it. Uh, bulky dressings around it, secured in place, all right, and prompt transport. Uh, remember also on those chest injuries, uh, any type of penetrating chest injury, uh, the potential for a entry wound and an exit wound. So we talk, when we talked about gunshot wounds the other night, that's, you know, that's a consideration for that. Uh, but even knife wounds, they may have multiple wounds front and back. So always do a good physical exam. Uh, don't focus on that one sucking chest wound or open pneumothorax on the front. You know, check the back. Make sure there's nothing there as well. Uh, you know, again, if you're not sure about it, put it, seal it up. Okay. Everything from the navel up, all right, you need to be considering the navel to the neck. You need to be considering for a chest seal. Okay. Because like I said, when those lungs expand and fill up with air, if they were, if they were, you know, that puncture happened, 
that penetration happened when those lungs were full, then you have the potential way down there with those floating ribs that we talked about tonight to, uh, you know, to be, to be able to impact the lungs also depending on the angle. So if it's a knife and they came out, came from underneath and it's a 10 inch blade or six inch blade, it could easily impact the, um, the lung. Okay. So the, the entry wound may be down here in the belly, but the tip of the knife punctured the wound, punctured the, um, you know, went through the diaphragm, punctured the lung, all sorts of stuff, right? So when in doubt, seal it up and um, on both sides and package for transport. Questions on anything from tonight? Rob, you have anything to add to the group? No, I was just listening. Good, good lecture. Okay. Hey, I was telling them uh, probably next week I have some stuff coming up, and uh, they have their last few chapters coming up, so uh, probably going to be a, a good time for them to kind of take a quick break, uh, maybe a day or two, and let them uh, catch up on their um, quizzes and their uh, stuff like that before we get into OB and PEDS and all that sort of stuff. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that that change in gears sometimes takes a little bit of getting used to. Also, uh, since you guys are here in the class, some of you are going to pay your 100 by check. Just want to make sure that those get turned in. That's all. All right. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Rob. Uh, so again, like I said, next week, um, I'll let you guys know through the Facebook group, but, uh, you know, probably Tuesday and Thursday. We'll take a break, let you guys get caught up. So again, no reason for you not to get caught up. All right. I've been harping on it every class. You got to get in there and get those quizzes done. Let's get caught up. Okay. And, uh, and get ready for these next few chapters. Like I said, a lot of, a lot of material, a lot of material that normally trips people up. Uh, so let's try to focus on these next few chapters and we'll be at the end. Okay. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start talking about skills and all that sort of stuff. Right. So if we don't have any more questions tonight, I appreciate it. Your uh, class code for tonight is going to be R0011, R0011. It's your class code for tonight. All right. If anybody doesn't have anything else, y'all have a good night. I appreciate it. Bye.